Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and uh, today I want to give you a look at a presentation, a seminar that I've been giving at various events um, uh, here in the, you know, in the eastern part of the United States. And the subject of it is 18th century smoothbore shooting. And I've done this at a, a couple of different venues, but I realize that most of you will probably never get a chance to see me give this presentation. So I thought, I thought I'd just pull it together and give it to you here uh, as a video. And, you know, hopefully some of the information in here will do you some good. So without further ado, I'm going to get right into 18th century smoothbore shooting. Now, this particular presentation was given at the 2023 School of the Long Hunter. And I've done the same one at Fort Loudon and a couple of other of other places, and I'll probably do it again in the future. And if I do, I'll try to let you know where I'm going to be. Now, the School of the Long Hunter is held at Prickett's Fort, uh, which is at Prickett's Fort State Park in West Virginia. And it's held every year the last weekend in March, first weekend in April. Um, and it's, it's well worth attending. And this is Prickett's Fort, as seen from the air. It's a great rebuilt... 18th century Indian Wars Fort in West Virginia, uh, close by the Monongahela River. And the School of the Long Hunter is a wonderful event because it combines 18th century camping and fort life uh, with a schoolhouse with seminars uh, all on that era. And every year it's different, and every year you learn something. So uh, I heartily recommend it. In this presentation, we're going to talk about three things. I'm going to give you a bit of a general overview on smooth bores and black powder. Then I'm going to talk specifically about military muskets. And then I'm going to wrap up with civilian smooth bores. So let's take a look at the, at the general overview. Well, first of all, you should understand that smooth bores, fouling pieces, muskets, they were the go to guns of the 18th century. Uh, rifles came along later in the century with some popularity, but they were very specific in terms of geography. And, and when I say that, I mean pretty much where German and Swiss immigrants were in appreciable numbers, you found rifles, and the rifle culture developed. And where you don't find those people, you don't find rifles. So... You know, in New England, New York, uh, eastern Pennsylvania to a certain extent, not so much. It's going to be smoothbore country. But uh, when, when you get into particularly in Pennsylvania with the influx of, of German immigrants, you get the rifle developing. And as they travel down the Great Wagon Road, you get the rifle moving basically along the Great Valley of the Appalachians. Uh, from Pennsylvania down to North Carolina and then over into Kentucky. And that's largely a phenomenon of the last third of the 18th century. But by far, the go-to gun for the 18th century is the smoothbore, whether it's a military musket or a civilian piece. Now, a lot of people think that smoothbores are not accurate, that you couldn't hit the, uh, the broadside of a barn from the inside of a barn, like you can't shoot them more than 20 yards, things like that. And that is untrue, and we're going to address that. Uh, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about gunpowder, because a lot of people believe that you can use 3F gunpowder for everything. It's, it's the best. And that's actually not the case. And, you know, I always tell people, that if 3F was the best for everything, powder manufacturers would only make 3F powder. You know, why would they bother making the other granulations? There's, there's no reason for it. Um, but as it turns out, there is a reason for it, and I'm going to explain that. And I'm also going to talk about how smoothbores were loaded in the 18th century, which is different from the way we load them today uh, in most cases. And it's important to understand how they were actually used rather than how we would like them to have been used. Now, for centuries, uh, the formula for gunpowder has been settled at 75% saltpeter, uh, which basically provides the oxygen for the burn, 10% sulfur, which lowers the ignition point of the compound, and then 15% charcoal, and that is the actual fuel. Okay, So that 15% charcoal 
is where all the power comes from. And we divide gunpowder into grain sizes, 1FG, 2FG, 3FG, and down 4FG, which we use uh, for priming. And that's all based on the size of the grain. And you can see the range in sizes for grains at the various uh, uh, powder levels. So 1FG is quite a bit coarser than 3FG, as we can see from this. Now, this might seem to be getting into too much detail for you guys, uh, but I'm going to explain how gunpowder burns. And gunpowder grains burn from the surface into the center. And because smaller grains have more surface area by weight than bigger grains, right? So even though 3F is smaller, it takes more grains to equal one grain of 2F. 2F has a certain surface area, but all those littler grains have surface areas that when you add them up are bigger, right? So that's why smaller charges, uh, smaller grain powder burns faster. Now, I'm going to point out that a pound of powder, whether it's 1F, 2F, or 3F, has exactly as much energy in it. So a pound of 1F has the same amount of energy in the can as a pound of 3F. The number of joules does not change uh, because the, number, the amount of carbon is the same. If you get a pound of 2F and a pound of 3F, there's exactly as much power in each of those pounds of powder. But 3F burns faster. And, and it does that because, as I said, 3F has six times the number of grains in the same volume of, of powder as one grain of 2FG. All right, so that means that if you compute the surface volume of all of those grains of powder, 2FG has 25,000 and change millimeters of surface area, and 3FG has 47,000 plus of surface area. So 3FG is going to burn faster than 2FG because it has two times the surface areas for the same volume of powder. Okay, so that would seem to be a good thing, and it is in some cases, and it's not in others. Now the problem with a fine powder like 3F is that if the powder is packed too densely, the flame can't easily propagate through that load column from grain to grain. Okay, so large charges of small grain powder are actually slower burning than large charges of larger grain powder. Now that might seem, um, you know, contrary to expectations, but it's really not if you think about it. So why is that important? Well, whether you're using a rifle or you're using a smoothbore, it's important because if you want to get the maximum velocity and accuracy from your gun safely, uh, then it matters. And, and velocity matters a great deal with black powder guns because they have a very, very poor ballistic coefficient, which means they drop fast. So the less time that it takes them to go from point A to point B, well, that's a very good thing. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens with various charges of powder. Let's start off with 3F. We start off with a load of 60 grains. We are going to get 1,191 feet per second uh, with a 20-gauge round ball. Okay, and that's loaded bare ball. So now if we jump up to 70 grains of powder, we go to 1,260 feet per second, which is a 17% increase in powder charge but only a six percent increase in velocity but that's still okay so if we move up to 80 grains of powder we now have a 14 percent increase in the charge and we get another six percent increase in velocity okay still not too bad when we go up to 90 percent 90 grains of powder we're adding another 13 percent to the charge but we only pick up one percent of velocity that's not good right when we go to 100 grains of powder we've added another 11 percent of powder and we only picked up another additional one percent of velocity and finally going to 110 grains of powder that's another 10 percent to the powder charge and yet only one percent to velocity so after we get above 80 grains what happens is 
we've added 30% more powder and we've only picked up 3% more velocity. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we use the same charge as a powder, but we use 2FG granulation instead of 3FG. All right, so you'll notice that we start with a lower velocity. Okay, so if we jump to the 70 grain charge, we're starting at 1175 feet per second for 2FG versus 1191 feet per second for 3FG. So that, uh, that seems like it's a bad thing right there, but you'll notice as we go up with the powder charges, something very different happens. So when we go from 70 to 80 grains of powder, as a for instance, right, we, we jump up 14% in the charge increase, but we pick up a full 10%, which is way better than we did with 3%, in the velocity increase. All right, and that's still at relatively low powder charges. Now, if we jump to the higher powder charges, you can see where this really pays off. When we get down to the 110 grain load of 2FG, we're up to 1,521 feet per second as opposed to 1,377 feet per second for 3FG. That is a huge increase. All right, and we did it really... Uh, without increasing pressures a great deal because we're picking up much higher marginal increases. And, and you can tell by the way the recoil feels that you're not getting excessive pressure, which when you have that really heavy recoil, you know you're starting to get into the high pressure world. So if we take a look at this, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that if you are going to be shooting light powder charges, you can get away with using 3F. So you can shoot 60 or 70 grains of 3F with light powder charges. And in fact, the way most people load today with a patched round ball uh, in a smooth bore, that will do quite well for them. So if that's the way you want to load, that's fine. But if you want to load by traditional methods where you use a bare ball, you need some real velocity behind that to make them shoot. And in order to get that velocity, you've got to use 2F powder because 3F powder just tops off, uh, and all you get is more pressure and not more velocity. So now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, let's talk about military muskets. And essentially, they all operate the same way. It doesn't matter whether you've got a British Brown Bass or you've got a Charleville or, you know, whatever, right? If you get some Belgian gun. Uh, now, I'm going to be using a British Brown Bass as an example gun, and I've got originals, and I've got a replica. And the replica is what I've used in testing. So these are my brown besses. The one on the top is an original brown bess. It's an East India pattern uh, gun. Those, those are pretty easy to find around. Um, it's a little bit shorter than uh, the Longland pattern. Uh, British gun on the bottom, which is a Pedasoli replica. It's a little bit shorter. It's a lot heavier. Um, and the Pedasoli gun is the one that I've used for testing for everything we're going to go for, talk about from here on. So the Brown Bess had a very long service life from 1722 until 1851. Uh, that ends up being lucky for us because it allowed us to get some data that might have been hard to come by otherwise. It's nominally a 75 caliber. The earlier ones were larger, 77 to 78 caliber. Uh, and, of course, they're loaded with paper cartridges, which we'll be talking about in just a bit. So when we talk about brown best loads, uh, my source for that is a book called The British Gunner by J. Morton Spearman. And my example is from, I believe, 1847. So it's, it's the British Ordnance Officer's Manual for the middle of the 19th century. And, and you might think, well, that's outside of our period. That's no good. But because of the long service life of the Brown Best Musket, it was still in service when Morton wrote this book. And therefore, he gave the loads for the Brown Bess. But even better than that, he compared the current loads to the loads of 1775 because the quality of powder had changed over that time. And, and therefore, we know the 1775 load and we know the 19th century load, and we know the kind of powders that we deal with. So we're able to come to some conclusions. Okay, so in 1775, 
the load was a 0.69 inch ball over six grams of 1FG powder. That's 164 grains of powder. That's what went into the paper cartridge. So that was nominally 15 grains of powder for priming and some spillage and 149 grains for the main charge. Now, thanks to Spearman, we also have the 1838 load. And that load is a little bit different. It's a, once again, a 69 caliber ball, but 4.5 drams of powder, which is 123 grains of 1F powder. And of course, that's zero for priming because by then they had been converted to percussion. So the whole 123 grains went into the main charge. So that is obviously different than the 149 grain main charge of 1775. So what's changed? Well, what's changed is the quality of the powder. By the mid 19th century, Europeans had figured out how to make black powder. I mean, figured it out. Okay, they made the best powder ever made during that period. Uh, and it's better than 18th century powder. And therefore, they had to adjust the charges in those old guns. Okay, so that's the 1775 load and the 1838 load for the Brown Bess. Here's my load. It's a little bit different. Uh, once again, it's a 69 caliber ball and 4.5 drams of powder. And I use 1.5 G Swiss powder for this. So 15 grains nominally goes into priming. That leaves 110 grains for the main charge instead of the 123 grains that Spearman quotes for the 1838 charge. So what's the difference, you might ask? Well, the difference is powder density. All right, so powder was less dense during the 19th century for muzzle loaders. The powder that we use today is what in the 19th century they would have used for black powder cartridges. And it is a little more tightly packed uh, per volume. It weighs more per, uh, per cubic centimeter than uh, the muzzle loading powder of the era did. All right, so because of that, I'm going to a slightly faster powder and I'm going to a little bit less of a charge. And to me, it works out exactly right uh, for the 80-yard um, point-blank range. So I think I'm on to something. So that's the load. How does it perform? Well, here are the British standards. Point-blank was 80 yards. You should be able to put your bayonet lug front sight right on there, 80 yards. You should drill them right in the heart. Okay. The max range for an individual target, uh, per the British requirements, was 150 yards. And a soldier was expected to be able to hit a man 50% of the time at 150 yards. Now, for a mass target, in other words, you're shooting at a formation, the maximum range was 300 yards. Now, I've tested Brown Bess extensively at these ranges. And I'm here to tell you that it does exactly what it's supposed to do if it's loaded with the appropriate paper cartridges. Uh, so at 80 yards, I can hit a man-sized target every time, no problem. At 150 yards, it's getting a little bit dicey, but I can hit the 50% standard of, of getting hits on, on that. I have not shot at mass targets at 300 yards because... I don't have a target that uh, occupies 100 yards of, of real estate, but I'm quite sure that this load would be able to take it out anytime. So these guns will do what they were supposed to do. So we've been talking about paper cartridges uh, being fired out of the brown bess, and this is what paper cartridges look like. And essentially, here's how they're loaded. I mean, use a paper tube, roll it up around a former, you know, a dowel, uh, get the ball in, choke the top off, put the powder charge in the back, and you're good to go. Here's a quick look at the loading technique using 18th century paper cartridges. So here's how they did it. You bit off the end of the cartridge, and one of the requirements for British soldiers is they had to have at least two teeth that mated. <laughs> now we're on half cock. 
I'm priming with the same powder that I'm going to be loading in the charge, which is 1F. So that gives you an idea. They didn't prime with 4F the way we do usually today. Now the entire rest of the charge goes in the barrel, and that is followed by the ball and the paper. Okay? And then that whole thing is rammed down. Now obviously they could do it much faster than I am and a good guy could do it three to four shots a minute. I am not a good guy and I'm not even trying for speed here. I'm just going to try for accuracy. Let's see how we did. Okay, I'm pretty sure I messed up and I only took four shots. I thought I was taking five. But anyway, how do we do it at point blank range? Well, we got one down here, not so good. One right in the shoulder, and then two right in the chest. I wish I'd shot the fifth one, but I think there's no doubt that at point blank range, we are going to take our man out. As I said, I think there is no doubt that we can hit what we're aiming at. Now, one of the things I get asked all the time about smooth bores is about buck and ball uh, paper cartridges. And I'll be honest with you, I was not a fan of buck and ball paper cartridges, and I kind of avoided working with them for the longest time. Uh, because in, in my experience, when I shot them, I ended up with four holes in the target. And, you know, any one of those holes would have made a soldier dead. Uh, four holes just makes them deader. And how dead can you be? So I was unimpressed. But I was prevailed upon to do some more tests. And it was kind of eye-opening. So I'm going to discuss buck and ball. And first of all, the buck and ball loads that I use come from the Ordnance Manual for the Use of Officers of the United States Army, 1850 edition. Uh, and that's because Spearman is silent about buck and ball, even though we know the British used buck and ball during the 18th century. Uh, but the Americans kept using buck and ball right up into the Civil War, and therefore we can use their information uh, and just translate it back to our era. Okay, so basically what we're looking at is uh, double-O buckshot and a 69 caliber ball. And for a normal buckshot load, we would use 12. Uh, but for a buck and ball load, I'm going to use 3. And I'm going to use the 125 grains of 1.5F as the charge. So I tried to develop an effective test for the combat effectiveness of buck and ball loads. And uh, I racked my brain, and this is what I came up with. And if I did it over again, I would do it differently because of what I learned. But basically, I took a line of seven um, human silhouette targets. And I lined them all up, and I numbered the inside targets one to five. And I only shot at the inside five targets, and I wanted to see what overlap I'd get on the outside targets I was not shooting at. Now, if I had this to do over again, I would shoot at every other target. Uh, but that's a lesson learned for another day. So I shot this at 25, 50, and 100 yards. And uh, let's take a look at the results. I'm going to shoot the five numbered targets, and we'll see how we do.
One. Five. All right. Well, let's go see how we did. <laughs> like I say, this barrel is red hot right now. Well, at 25 yards, every target looks like this. Each opposing soldier got hit with one musket ball and with two buckshots. Nothing, nothing in either of the outliers. So at this range, 25 yards, bucking ball is like a waste of time because the ball is going to do all the work you need. All right, just to make it more clear, here's what it looked like at 25 yards. I've marked the uh, buckshot with small orange dots and the musket balls with big ones. Well, after that, I moved all the targets out to 50 yards and shot everything again. Okay, I cleaned the brown bass. I took a fouling shot. That may seem counterintuitive, but I want to have the same conditions for each, each range we're firing at. Uh, I'm loaded up with buck and ball, and I'm ready to go with 50 yards. So let's see how it goes here. Five. All right, well, we shot at 50 yards. Let's go see how many of them we killed. Okay, well, at 50 yards, we're getting some spread on that buckshot, and it is making a difference. For instance, my outside target that I didn't shoot at picked up a buckshot pretty close to the heart. So we got him without even trying. But I am finding that I'm not as accurate with this load as I am shooting the regular musket load. And our last guy who was not shot at got off scot-free. So we got seven men up here, took five shots and hit six of them with, with killing shots. So, and that is pretty effective. Probably more effective, well obviously one person down more effective than it would have been with just a round ball. But I'm not getting the kind of accuracy out of this that I get just out of my musket balls. So maybe something to consider, maybe not, since this is really designed for volley fire. So for the final round of my buck and ball test, I moved our targets out to 100 yards and I fired the same procedure, five rounds just on the inside targets, not shooting at the two outside targets. So let's take a look at it. One. That's five. Well, that's five buck and ball at 100 yards. Let's go down there and see how we did. So, how effective is buck and ball? Well, I'm not loving it. But I'll tell you what, I would not want to have volley fire against me shooting it because it's throwing up a screen of lead. And if there's a second rank behind these guys, I'm sure they're picking up some of the misses from this first round. So that's what buck and ball does. And at 100 yards, that buckshot is spreading all over the place, totally uncontrolled. But if you're firing at a mass of troops, something's going to get hit. So for my final topic on uh, the military muskets, I'm going to talk about how you carry your ammo. So we're going to talk about cartridge boxes, and then we're going to talk about bags and pouches. Typically, uh, military ammunition would be carried in a cartridge box. So you can see uh, a variety of them over here. They were made to either mount on a shoulder strap or on a belt. And, uh, I mean, basically it's a formed uh, leather pocket. And inside there's a wooden block that's drilled out to accept the paper cartridges for your particular gun. So you would have all of your cartridges, one in each of these holes. You could just reach in, grab a tail, pull it out, and get to loading. So that's your typical military setup. But here in North America, cartridge boxes could be in short supply. 
And they can be complicated to make, obviously. You've got a wooden part, you've got a leather part, you've got straps. So oftentimes, uh, for militia particularly, they would substitute a shot pouch. And what I'm showing you is my copy of the Lemuel Lyman uh, shot pouch, which was used at the Battle of Lake George in um, 1755. And basically, uh, this was made to go on a belt. I've modified it to use shoulder straps. But it's got two pockets inside. One pocket uh, would handle your accoutrements, tools, and the other one would handle your balls and wads and uh, or your cartridges should you have cartridges and this was very typical and and sometimes they didn't even make them out of leather they would make them out of heavy canvas so this is these are the uh the ways you can carry your ammunition for a military impression okay so now we're going to switch gears we're, that wraps up our military discussion and now we're going to talk about civilian smoothbores and uh, we're going to talk about loading techniques and I kind of break those down into historical or practical. <laughs> now, the sources that I use for this primarily are these three books. And these are all 18th century uh, treatises on shooting. So, luckily, the 18th century is loaded with uh, treatises written by uh, enthusiastic amateurs. Um, 18th, even the a good bit of the 19th century, uh, is full of that kind of literature. So you can actually see how these guns were loaded uh, at the time. To start off this discussion, um, talking about patched round balls, and I'm going to do that because this this can be controversial. I just want to get it out there right up front uh, because most people today that I am aware of at every every match I've been to. Most people load their smoothbores with patched round balls, just like they load their rifle. And uh, I've got to tell you that there's no documentation for that for our period. And I know you're going to think it sounds crazy. Anybody could figure that out. You know, I'm sure they they all did it. Well, maybe I don't know. Uh, the documentation that we have for shooting round balls is either in military cartridges or wadded with paper or tow. Uh, those are the two things that round balls are usually wadded with. We'll talk about other things for shot. And you see no documentation for patching them. Now, does that mean it didn't happen? I don't know. And none of us do. I mean, no documentation is kind of like no evidence at a murder scene. Uh just because there's no evidence doesn't mean somebody isn't dead, right? He's still dead. Uh, we just don't know how. So that's that's the first thing, though, is if you want to load in 18th century fashion, you won't be loading with a patch round ball. Okay, so having said that, how did they load uh, their smoothbores then if they were using ball? And and believe me, in Europe, smoothbores at this point you know, in England particularly, were mostly used for small game, not for large game. Uh, but uh, we know that smoothbores were used uh, in warfare and not always with paper cartridges. And we actually have some evidence on that. Colonel Gage, uh, later to be General Gage of the American Revolution, but during the French and Indian War, Colonel Gage uh, pioneered the use of light infantry. He, he established a light infantry regiment. And when he was getting it set up, he considered arming them with powder horns and shot bags. And uh, the, the, he thought that might be better for accuracy than using paper cartridges. And ultimately, he decided against it because, as he said, he would have needed to provide either tow or cut paper to use for wadding, and that was harder to come by, and uh, he was going to go with paper cartridges. So uh, that's a pretty good hint as to how these things were shot. I have both 12-gauge and 20-gauge smoothbore guns, and I'm going to share with you uh, my bare ball loads for each of those guns. And now your mileage may vary, but this will give you a good idea of 
maybe a starting point or, or what you can you can work towards. These will shoot very accurately. Uh, so my 12 gauge load is a 0.72 inch diameter ball powered by 110 grains of 2F Swiss powder. And then I use a one and a half inch folded paper wad over it. So shopping bag paper works well. I actually, I use the paper that B29 uh, targets are made out of. But uh, I'll just cut a one and a half inch by three inch strip and fold it in half and just ram that down on top of the ball. You don't need a, a uh, wad between the ball and the powder for a bare, bare ball load. And then when it comes to the 20 gauge load, it's, it's uh, pretty similar. I use a 610 diameter ball. The same 110 grain powder charge. I've just found that that, for some reason, is the magic number. And then I either use a one-inch folded piece of paper, so a piece of paper that's one inch by two inches folded in half, or a one-inch square piece of wool blanket. And I actually prefer that in the 20 gauge. It seems to work better in the 20 gauge than in the 12 gauge, so I, I have stopped using it in the 12 gauge. But in the 20 gauge... Uh, the blanket wads seem to work like a charm, and they are historically correct. Well, let's see how old Lemuel Lyman's bag works in actual practice. We'll put it to the test. We're going to use it against Swing and Sam down there in Swing City, and we'll see if we can hit him a couple of times. He's about 35 yards away. Okay, powder. I'm using 110 grains of 2FG. I reach in, grab a wide and a ball. Ball goes in, patch. Send it down. I'm going to prime from the horn with 2F. I think I missed him. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get him this time. We'll do it again. Powder. Grab a patch and a ball. Pop the ball in. Run the patch in. I gotta tell you, the humidity is pretty awesome today, so my glasses are fogging up. Something that Lemuel probably didn't have to worry about, but it was a hot, humid day when he did his, too. Cock it, and let's see if I can get them. Whacked them.
Now, when it comes to uh, shot loads, uh, because I know we all like to take our guns out turkey shooting, the uh, recommendations can vary quite a bit. In, in Page's book, he says the common practice is to load a pipe bowl of powder in a bowl and a half a shot, uh, but that he prefers an equal volume of powder and shot, a square load, in other words. So I don't know how much powder or shot fits in a pipe bowl. I mean, I don't know if we're talking little clay tavern pipes or if we're talking great big Sherlock Holmes pipes. I have no idea. So that's a little imprecise. Uh, but at least you get the volume, the relative volumes, uh, the ratios down. Now, Reeves also goes with equal volume loads. And, uh, you know, tetra, tetraplegia recommends one-third more powder than shot, which, which is basically back up to your bowl and a half a shot to one bowl of powder. Which brings us to what I do. So my powder charge, uh, I know a lot of you are going to think this is quite heavy, is 100 grains of 2FG Swiss powder. Now, over the powder, you're going to need an over powder wad. You, you didn't need that with a round ball, but you're going to need it here because uh, you need a gas seal because that shot charge is like a sieve, so no good. So the historically correct... Uh, wad materials are cut paper toe or felt or leather okay uh i use two ounces a shot and of course whatever size you need to use for the game that you're hunting and then for the over the shot wad i use the same cut paper that i used over the ball all right so all the same so let's talk a little bit about wads uh when we look at our sources Page and Reeves both prefer cut paper for over the powder and over the shot. And um, the, the reason for that is, is really pretty simple. So cut paper is easy to come by, and it's really easy to carry in the field. Okay, so these are cut paper wads for a 20-gauge gun. So that, that sheet that's unfolded is one inch by two inches. So the folded ones are an inch squared, double thickness. And all I did is punch a hole in one corner of, uh, of each of those papers and thread it on a string that I could tie right to the strap of my shot, shot pouch. And when I need a wad, all I have to do is reach up and just rip it off of that string and, and wad it down. Uh, so it was very handy, and this is a very common way of carrying paper wads. So that's that's why... Uh, they get recommended um, pretty pretty highly in the 18th century. So cut paper certainly seemed to be the preference, but a lot of other things were also recommended. Uh, what I would call the normal stuff, like like felt or uh, or leather or toe, and then the exotics, because people always bring this up to me. You know, what about using beaver fur or wasp nests or leaves or, you know, hundred dollar bills, whatever. Well, anything you can jam down the muzzle is going to work, right? I mean, wasp nests, I assume they work just fine. I'm not shot them much myself, just a little bit. And I don't think they're worth, worth the effort of finding, but, uh, but if you got wasp nests, by all means, use them. Uh, beaver fur, I, next time I shave a beaver, maybe I'll keep, keep the fur. I don't know. But, uh, you know, whatever you got, it'll probably work. But I'd rather stick with the tried and true. So this photograph shows the typical wadding materials of the 18th century. And over to the left, we've got flax fibers, which are called tow. So you can see a hank of tow, and then you see two tow balls. And uh, that's what you would do is you just rip off a bit of that tow, roll the fibers into a ball, Shove it down the muzzle. It's as simple as that. I, I used to use tow all the time. I only stopped a couple of years ago. We were having a dry year. And every time I shot, I set the woods on fire. And I decided that was probably not a good way to go. I was running around stamping out uh, stamping out forest fires every time I took a shot at something. So I got away from, from tow and uh, went to other materials. 
And as we go counterclockwise around the circle, the next one you'll see is cut paper. And we've already discussed that. It's uh, very practical and was, was favored during the time. So the next stop over, once again counterclockwise, is uh, leather. You can punch wads right out of leather. They used to call it Old Saddle uh, back in the 18th century. And it gives the best gas seal. So there's a lot to be said for using leather as an overpowder wad in, in your shot column. And then the final material is also cut uh, with a punch, and that is felt, about a quarter-inch thick felt. And that stuff works great for a cushion wad. So how was smoothbore ammunition carried, uh, civilian ammunition carried in the 18th century? Well, if you were a British gentleman, you carried most of your loading materials in your coat pockets. That was, that was very common. And, of course, you'd have one or two servants along to carry a second gun, uh, maybe some more shooting supplies, and certainly snacks and champagne. And that's the way it ought to be done. But let's say that you're short on servants. Maybe it's their day off. Uh, or maybe you're one of those Americans, right? So let's let's take a look at how Americans would have carried their smoothbore stuff. So there's a difference between war and hunting. Let's let's just say that, and and the way you would carry things. Now, if you were out on the frontier, uh, that difference might be non-existent because you were pretty much always in uh, in a similar state. But if you were Back on the eastern seaboard, where life was easier, uh, you might have had hunting bags versus fighting bags. So let's just take a look at, uh, at some of the bags that you could be using. So the bag on the right here, this, is, this was my smoothbore bag for quite a while. It's made by Geneseo Trading Company. It's an excellent bag. Uh, but I've got an Exo Lyman bag just to give you an idea of the difference in size. So the Lyman bag is about seven inches long. Uh, and as you can see, the Geneseo Trading Company bag is quite a bit longer. And it's full of pockets and pouches. I can put different wadding materials in, all sorts of, of stuff. But it is pretty much the size of a good-sized steamer trunk. <laughs> you know, And uh, I've, I've gotten away from using that in the last few years and gone with more authentic bags. So it's hard to get more authentic than the Lyman pouch that we already talked about. And uh, I actually use this all the time with my 20 gauge. Uh, it's, it is a great, great little bag. I mean, it's no bigger than you need. Uh, and it functions quite well because the way I do it, I put loose balls and wadding in the front pouch. The, the bag is, has an internal gusset that divides it into into two, pow two, two pockets. So I put tools in the back pocket, screwdrivers, stuff like that, you know. And uh, in the front pocket, I just dump in bare balls and wadding. And then I can just reach in and get what I want. I don't have to open up another pouch and get a ball out of it, blah, blah, blah. None of that stuff. You can go very fast. You reach in, grab a ball, grab a wad, throw it down the bore, and, and off you go. So it's very handy. And I'll carry my shot in a separate shoulder strap pouch, uh, specifically for shot. Now, the only real downside of the Lyman bag is that it's flat as a pancake. So, you know, when you're putting in those big old uh, musket balls, they're, they're bulging it out at the bottom. And it, it, can, uh, it can make it hard to actually pull stuff out. Uh, I like it. I use it with my 20 gauge, but for my 12 gauge, I had a different bag made by Eric Fleischer. This is the same size as the Lyman bag, uh, but it actually has two gusseted pouches. So instead of, you know, one piece of leather divided by a piece of leather inside, uh, this has two separate pouches that have gussets, so they have a little bit of width. So those 12-gauge balls fit in the bottom of, of that pocket very well. But I use it exactly the same way as I use the Lyman bag. The, the back pocket uh, has my tool kit. It's got a little cleaning kit, uh, some spare flints, a little bit of tow for wiping up. And all that is in the back pouch and the front pouch. 
is just 12 gauge balls and cut paper uh, wads. So that wraps up uh, my presentation on 18th century smoothbores. As I said, this was given at Fort Loudon uh, at the 18th century market fair and at Prickett's Fort uh, for the School of the Long Hunter. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something useful out of it. And I will see you all next week. Bye.